Okay, today we're going to look at somebody from Egypt in the 12th dynasty. He's known as Jehuti Nacht. Jehuti is actually the name of what we call Thoth, the god who gave all writing and all of those things. Yeah, so his name has an attachment to him. In the top left-hand corner, we actually see his mummified head. And next to it are three CTI scans of it. Over here on the right, at the top, is also his head. Bottom right is a Shabti doll that he has. Here's depictions of him on his chest that are there. And again, his mummified head. But then, that one on the left, at the very bottom, is showing people bringing gifts and offerings to him, which are shown as ducks in there. And this is the 12th dynasty again, but this is one of the best representations that they have of artwork. This man was apparently incredibly well hooked up to have gotten all of this artwork into him, but he was known to have been a governor of the Hare Gnome, which is more in Middle Egypt, and there are different gnomes through there, like city-states, like Sumeria had, even though they were bound into one and off and on at times. And he was the ruler of this. His remains were found in Deir el Bersha, necropolis in the Middle Egypt. Now this necropolis that they found is where they, in the limestone cliff, dug a bunch of tombs for nobility and so on so he's not a regular person as I've described he's nobility his mummified head is in well-preserved condition as you can see and we'll look at it a little here in a moment later he's preserved with tufts of his wavy brown hair as it described it when we look closer at it you'll be able to see that it has a little bit of a blonding effect to it I'll get into that more it's sticking through the bandages that are still wrapped around his head and his due to his mummification. And all of the gold and jewels have been looted and ancient grave robbers took them. Many of these artifacts still remain with him. And he uh, was a disjuncted head that was left in there. Which is, again, a little bit of an oddity. So whenever you look into this man who's named after Thoth and their genetics, they were able to test it and find out who he was originally related to and who we could correlate these ancient Egyptians to in the 12th dynasty, where we've discussed many different dynasties before. But so let's just look at this here a little bit. This is known as the Beersha procession that you're seeing over on the left. Let's see if I can get that back down a little bit more right. And in this procession, there are a lot of women, and it looks like a priest type person for his shaved head or low cut hair. For if we look at it closer, he actually has blonde hair. Now, women are always drawn as pale and usually washed over with a yellow ochre, signifying that they're able to be kept pale and they don't have to go out and toil anymore and get real tanned up like the males, which are symbolically shown in red ochre. Now, this is nothing unique to Egypt. It's seen all through the Middle East. All Caucasians actually did this and have attachments back to red ochre burials going back tens of thousands of years. Not only is this red ochre, though, a sunblock that works pretty damn good, it also is symbolic, and you can see it in the Greek art in Minoans and Etruscans, the Mitanni, all kinds of people around the Mediterranean. And we're actually not confused about any of them either, are we? So his funerary equipment, what was left there with his head, includes pottery, canoptic jars, models showing men and women in different daily life activities, several model boats, which we'll look at one here later, and a famous exquisitely carved and painted processional group composed of a priest and four offering bearers known as the Bersha Procession.
And we'll take a little bit closer look at this procession. We'll let them come do the procession across in front of us like it would have been done. So, this is in the Museum of Fine Arts, by the way. And we'll look at that in just a moment here, too. So, here comes that procession. And what's odd is you can see the wash body, and he is a more tan color than the pale whitewashed women, real pale yellow, if you will, compared to him. It was a tan color, but I don't know if it picks up, but his hair, this is a priest, is blonde. They're carrying their baskets on their heads and so on, and carrying processional items with them. Now this wood probably darkened long ago under the paint that's on there, so whenever you see some that are unpainted, sometimes people try to get confused. But these intricate carvings and paintings on the governor's outer coffin make it a coffin, make it an unparalleled masterpiece that's been found in Middle Kingdom art. You can see how intricate it is, how intricate his necklace is, the beauty of the birds that are shown there and so on. And this is really only regulated for pharaohs. And there are quite a few pharaoh's tombs which don't have art at this level. So again, I mentioned that he must have been pretty well hooked up. And the artisans that dealt with his items must have been of the finest of the time. So Jehudi Nock, a governor, the gnome of hares. What have we taken? Did a CAT scan, an X-ray here. They could tell things about him, but an archaeologist with one simple glance can tell by facial structures and nasal structure too that this was a Caucasian type skull and something more of a Mediterranean Eurasian type. There are a lot of different ones, and it, you can date back to 3500 B.C. and well beyond where this type of skull was found there. Here we can see it is his representative doll and his wife that are next to him here, and of course it's showing the rings and the wood where it's darkened slightly. It almost looks like her fabric, though, in the pleating that they did in it, so that's pretty neat. And though wood darkens over time, this was made from sycamore yew wood, which is extremely pale wood at the time. And of course, these objects weren't supposed to be viewed thousands of years later, but only for the time that they were made, depicting the colors they should be. On the right here, we see processions that are seen like that. And here's one much more fancy, if you will. The dresses are extremely well painted out. Both of these women have red hair. They're from the tomb of Mehen Quetri. A lot of people look at these and they say, well, whenever you see the hair on them, that's not hair. That's a uh, cowling like they put on, like the pharaohs have and stuff, and that's not true. They're trying to represent their hair. In a moment, we're going to go into a look on hair, and we'll look at Jehudi Nacht a little bit further here. But these are people's hair. Women are draped forward and men, through a good portion of the time, were draped back in what you would consider to be a mullet nowadays. Yeah, they had long hair. A lot of times that was a wig. So you see things like this that are wigs. And of course all the wigs that they find are Caucasian type hair. So this is just an unknown woman, but you can tell that her hair's parted, and this is, of course, her hair. And if we look all the way over here at the right, and in all of them, this was supposed to be representing their hair. And again, here's that mullet, and here's the knot. Here's a couple of wigs that are on display, and then, of course, it's even done at the bottom in braiding and stuff done to it. Gold little leaf symbols on one run, and then red dots on another and leaves and stuff. But it's all Caucasian hair. Some of these have been found to be blonde. A couple of them weirdly have been mixed and so on too, which is just strange. But in a modern day, we could probably see somebody doing something like that. Then there are ones like this that is representative of this version right here. So this is supposed to be Queen Yure. 
And you can see here they presented this idea, although she's missing her top cap right here. So she's bald. Well, for quite a period of time, the Egyptians were balding their hair and then making wigs and then utilizing wigs. You can see here where they've taken plaited her hair and then they take these brads and they go around it. But then the next layer down, they take half of one and half of the other and put it together and brad it there and then split it back and then brad it and split it back. All hair that's been found from there and wigs and so on are actually Caucasian type hair. But more than that, they can even be blonde and red-headed like Ginger the Gibbeline pre-dynastic mummy. Or Ramses. Or even the granddaughter of Khufu, if you'll look it up in the tomb that she's depicted in is shown as a red head with this real pointy jacket on it makes it look like she's 1980s new wave let's go ahead and take a jump here and look at this before we come back and look at genetic data here we are seeing Jehudi Nacht he actually has his own wiki page yep they're really getting on top of it here and it's been updated here in October so I thought I would do it from that but he's in tomb, a, tomb 10a it's the beer Deir El Bersha Necropolis in Middle Egypt it was found in 1915 by the American Egyptologist George Andrew Reisner, who was a leader of the Harvard University Boston Museum of Fine Arts Expedition. Almost nothing was left of the outer chapel, but the burial chamber, although rated already of the jewelry, still contained several fine painted cedar and wooden coffins belonging to Jehudi Nock and his wife. Above all, his outer coffin, commonly referred to as the Beersha coffin, renowned as the finest painted coffin Egypt produced and a masterpiece of panel painting. Along with the other coffins in the tomb were found Newmark's mummified head, as well as Lady Jehudi Nock's canopic chest, a great number of funerary uh, furniture such as pottery, canopic jars, several model boats, and models of men and women in different daily activities. A famous group composed of a priest and many offerings uh, by girls known as the Beersha procession, as it says, and it's entirely these objects form the largest Middle Kingdom funerary assemblage ever found. So one would think if he was around during the time now, they, they claim him to be at the 12th dynasty, and here they make a connection that uh, that's not actually true. They say that uh, originally they thought that he was around the time of Pharaoh Sinshareth the third, the one that we talk about all the time, who had pushed the boundary farther back into Nubia, farther than ever before, and set up the Semne Stele boundaries there in the eighth and sixteenth regnal years, showing you that the Nubians weren't allowed even into Egypt, and they had to bring those processional items to Semna, or actually even farther than that a place that was built for such activities to go on to and they weren't allowed to come down the Nile and so on but that's for a different video and I've got another one coming that shows something about that same situation and the way that fort looked there in Buhin real out of place for its time just real highly advanced let's just say so they say that he was thought that he was around the 12th dynasty from the analysis of furniture has been deducted that he actually lived in an earlier period and he's probably at the end of the 11th dynasty. So here, 11th dynasty. He was the son of a nomarch known as Anak the I and the successor of his brother Anak the II and predecessor of the nomarch Nehari. Otherwise, he was the same Jehudi Nak the V and then he lived during the late reign of Pharaoh Amenhat of the 12th dynasty or end of the 11th into the 12th and was Nehari's son and the successor of his wife Jehuti Hotep and the uncle of his successor Nehari. In either case, no children are known from Jehuti Nacht and his wife afterwards though. So let's look at these today real quick. Here's a better look of his stylization that's shown here. Although he's shown with black or darkened hair here, we're going to find out that he has somewhat of a blonde looking hair. Here's some of the depictions on his chest, and earlier we were looking at a close-up of this area right in here. And an area on the other side that showed them 
carrying the ducks and so on that are there. Here's that procession again, and the pictures here are just so yellowed out that you can't tell really the difference on the cowling of the head. And then it had yellow hair. And when they say brown wavy hair on him, poking through his scarf here, hopefully you can make it out pretty good, that this is really a blondish, brassy hair. Much like myself, who had a golden blonde hair whenever I was younger, and it turned dark over ages. And that's probably what we're looking at here. I'm familiar with looking at it a whole lot. You can also tell from his phenotype, and man, he was a well preserved mummy too again leading you the idea that this Jehudi knocked was well hooked up comes to mind right now that if the dynasties were to fall apart during that time he would probably have been a big candidate for those who would step in and become Pharaoh here's a procession of the boat Seeing this, I almost think that that prow up in front and this little thing that looks like a dinosaur bone stuck up here should be twisted around and aiming the other way like at an angle here, but that's just me. You can see all these guys in the boat, and they're all done with red ochre as opposed to all the other ones they saw. Well, if you were out on the sun, on the Nile, constantly working like that, you'd get a good tan too, and you'd probably also wear that red ochre sunblock that they know. Here's another picture of her and her dress. Again, that's like her hair. No one knows what hair she really had. In fact, why don't we just wiki hair? Just hair itself. Hair. I'm going to wiki hair. And you really don't want to do this unless you want to know all about hair because they go all into it with the rooting systems and all kinds of stuff, different textures of hair. In fact, they tell you that Andre Walker, has come up with a new hair typing system other than the ones we already had going and he is Oprah Winfrey's barber and he came up with the ideas on different types of hair all the way from kinky and wiry hair down to wavy and curly and then straight and gives you guides on it and everything which some people have looked at being a little twisted they even talk about polar bears and how they glean warmth out of having their hair being a lighter color naked mole rats, arctic foxes, and why they turn white and so on like that too. But if we got down right here to where we're talking about wavy hair, so you come down about halfway here, let's look at wavy hair. Well, let's look at this guy. Now, this is a guy from Brazil that's on their soccer team. I don't know where he's originally from, if from there or whatever. David Luiz. But we can see the blonding in his hair, too, and it's very curly. So that's one mentioning of how far curly could be, and there's probably no discerning that he probably doesn't even have any admix. This is looking straightforward here, isn't it? Now, that hand on his shoulder is a different idea, but what we're really going to look for in hair is curly. And so what Wiki likes to use for curly hair and seems to go greatly with what we've been talking about and Herodotus talking about how they have curly hair and so on is this. This is the exhibition showing you some of the wigs and actually a scalp directly off still containing the skin connected to the head of yellow curly hair. And while you and I might differ on the fact that the one on the right seems to be a little bit more strawberry blonde than what would be just blonde here. The one on the left is definitely more blonde. It's the one that's attached to a scalp. So they tell you that, where did they find this set? Well, it's a yellow curly hair and scalp from a body which had a long black wig over that hair. What? Maybe that's the reason that you see a whole lot of black wigs. It was the trend, as you can see. What color were the Egyptians' hair? Oh, all kinds of different hair. A lot of blonde and redheads, too, has been shown. The necropolis out there that Brigham Young University has been digging in for 20 years and have gone through a million bodies find that it's pretty declamated open between blonde-haired people in one area, red-haired people separated in another, and then all the darker-haired people separated in another. It's a strange anomaly. 
The parts of the wig plait remains from Egypt Garob, 23, 18th to 19th dynasty. So it's around King Tut's time and a little bit later when we have King Ramses, the great. And of course, he's been known to have been a pale leucoderm with red hair in his youth, although he's quite older. So uh, there, hair. I don't know how long it'll stay on here because people get mad. People that look like this wanted to claim that they were ancient Egyptians, but that's far from reality. So again, let's just go back here and look. And we've got all the hair and wigs. So we're past that point on hair, and we realize that man probably had what they call brown hair. Seemed to be a fading, dirty blonde. And so the Middle Kingdom people, now we've talked about early kingdom and so on, but this is the Middle Kingdom people, so you can see what they basically look like. And though you might find red ochre representations, no one's going to be confused about that, just like we're not confused about people shown in red ochre art everywhere else around the Mediterranean, which Egypt is a Mediterranean civilization. On the left we have Kanum Hotep, Middle Kingdom around 1755 BC, National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. Pretty easy to see the declamations here in the different way and what these people look like. Egyptian mask of a mummy, probably of a woman discovered at Ayasut, Middle Kingdom. Funny she's wearing fabric and cut out for her tits. Canoptic jar of K in the Middle Kingdom, 12th Dynasty, and there's actually a fantastic mummy sarcophagus like the one on the far left for K. And he shows this thin little line around here, and it was just weird. He looks like something from some heavy metal band. Egyptian woman figurine on the right, Middle Kingdom, 12th to 11th Dynasty, so the time that we're talking about, too. And you can see that's supposed to be her hair wafted back in a hairstyle that's still common today. But that's in a museum in Arts de Lyon, France. Though there are some depictions people would like to try to get confusing, like maybe even at the one at the bottom because it's slightly darker. Or things that are red ochre, like the canoptic jars. That's not the really truth of the matter. No, we can probably go on past this point to the DNA results. Since we've figured out what we're looking at when we talk about the Middle Kingdom. MTA genome profile independently obtained from the tooth both by the FBI and HMS or Harvard Medical School were identical and found in table S2, which I won't show you right here, but it's the haplogroup and haplotype belongs to mtDNA lineage U5. U5B2 B5 to be exact. What's all that crap with all the extra numbers on the letters on the end and so on? That's usually decimations of some little specific genetic component that is in one and isn't in another, but you actually had me at U5 and U5B. For U5B is the common haplogroup of European hunter-gatherers, early European hunter-gatherers in mtDNA. One would say it must carry from the times of Cro-Magnon, which are now referred to as early European modern humans because their DNA is still extant today. And so, pretty easily to tell that these were European-type people. Or what you would say, northern Middle Eastern-type people at, at one time. When we look and try to find a sequence, they did find a sequence closely related to it that's still in Lebanon today. However, the two haplogroups still differ at five positions, three of them in the control region, and a comparison between the mummy CR and the CR sequences from MPOP database produced no match. Due to intermixing, you get little flares and little sequences and little pieces in people's genetics. So if you had something that was real close over long term, it would be amazing. 
if you had an exact match. To better understand the mtDNA lineage of the mummy in the context known Egyptian mtDNA diversity, the mummy haplogroup was compared to the mtDNA haplogroup distribution of 668 Egyptians from various modern populations. The dominant haplogroups among this data set were haplogroup T, which we've talked about before too, at 11.9% and L3 or slightly less. Out of the 64 individuals who belong to haplogroup U, 7 belong to haplogroup U5, and 3 belong to one of the U5B subgroups, U5B1C and U5B1D1A and U5B2A5. So these are all variations on U and U5 haplogroups. But again, whenever you say U5, regardless of derived ones after it, they all hook up to early European hunter-gatherers from back before they even were that point. And again, those are the same people that brought with agriculture and grains and domesticated crops and animals into Egypt well pre-proto-dynastic, over 7,000 BC, and became the Caucasian Egyptians that we all know of today from the pre-dynastic. If you wanted to go with hair, again, we could go with Ginger, the bronze-haired pre-dynastic Gibeline mummy, but he also could have been in those Narmer palettes where people are getting killed off and things are happening, and they found that he was stabbed in the back. Also found that he has tattoos, much like Utsi the Iceman. Now, strangely, too, Utsi the Iceman is U5, has tattoos and so on. Way up there. That's because early European modern humans got around a whole bunch. It's a real common mtDNA haplogroup. Along with K, which we find later in the 18th dynasty through King Tut. And it's in there, and that also shows a Proto-Indo-European or European-Asiatic haplogroup. It's still common today. Not surprisingly, no direct matches in the Judy Knot sequence have been reported. Much exact sequences are even trying to find one of his children. If you found somebody exact, you'd have to realize that he's probably real closely related to them. But not so much if there were a whole lot of people that had U5B2B in. Because related U5B2B sequences have been observed in ancient human remains from Europe and a haplogroup U5B2C1 haplogroup was recently discovered and a 2,000-year-old remains from Phoenicia. So, again, we're connecting it to the Phoenicians. When only the mtNA sequences recovered from ancient Egyptian remains are considered, the Jehudi Nock sequence most closely resembles a U5A lineage from sample JK2903, a 2,000-year-old skeleton from Abu Sir el Melek. Well, uh, interesting, we have that name again, Abusir Melek, after this was all made here, has been found that they ended up getting over 90 mummies' DNA out of it, and uh, U5 is also shown in that quite a bit, along with a lot of others that are all Eurasian, known Caucasian DNA. So the Shehudi Noct was an apparent character, and in the leading class, and we can see that that red and blonde hair is especially in the leading class. They even talk about how they say, well, we rule over the dark-haired people. Well, a lot of those dark-haired people we were looking at just a second ago are wearing blonde hair up under their wig, as in that scalp, and then a darker wig or a black wig over that, which is, of course, also made from Caucasian hair. The deep presence of Eurasian mtDNA lineages in North Africa has therefore been clearly established with these recent reports and offers further support for the authenticity of the Eurasian mtDNA sequences observed in Jakuti Knox mummy. This was in another paper talking about it. In the present study, Near Eastern influence has been found in an individual of high social status who lived in Upper Egypt during the Middle Kingdom. There are a lot of DNA samples that they took and wrote off because it looked like it was Eurasian and they didn't want to have that show up. 
and things like that. But I think nowadays, after looking at King Tut and all the other ones did, we probably need to take a second look at those. Every single one of them. Or just go ahead and publish the ambiguous one that you said may not be correct. A lot of people would say just retest them to where you're no and you're valid. So, this deep presence of Eurasian MTDN lineages in North Africa has been around for over 30,000 years, though. It's nothing really new. The Caucasian presence all around the Mediterranean, which means Middle Earth, has been going on forever. In fact, whenever they left to go out of Africa and come back in, they were seen as already modern humans and homo sapiens, sapiens at 325 to 315,000 years before. This predates anybody else being able to say that we was. In fact, the dating on Astelar Man shows you that some of these people didn't exist until a much more recent time and are derived out of a hominid species that still existed in Sub-Saharan Africa and other places around the planet up until a much more modern time and it doesn't become that linear oh, Homo erectus was way back at 300, 400, 500,000, half a million years ago. No. I've shown that in some of my other vids too. Trill archaeology, reality. Over the past year, molecular techniques developed and routinely used by the ancient DNA community have finally permitted the recovery of indigenous DNA from ancient Egyptian remains. And that Abersel Aramelech was one showing of that, and it continues on further, and confidence levels go higher and higher. Here, those techniques were employed to recover the complete MT genome of the 4,000-year-old mummy Jehudi Nock and determined that biological sex was male. All of these approaches have been recently adopted and implemented by the forensic community to develop probative mitochondrial DNA, data from the most degraded specimens. Further work is needed to recovery of individual identifiable nuclear and Y DNA markers. Assays will need to be optimized and cost-effective workflows developed to achieve accurate and reliable calls from limited quantities of damaged nuclear DNA. So apparently what they're saying by this is that we're going to be able to start sequencing their Y-DNA out of it too, even though we're finding portions of it by working with this system and trying to find it and signifying markers and like they do where they explode it out and they make multiple copies of it and they see what keeps showing up and so on. Because the snippets and SMPs that they have, they find that they have locus areas and the way they connect to locus areas actually show you how long ago things happened and so now they've been able to really pretty much discern whether this is a current DNA of somebody just a few years ago or if this is DNA from thousands of years ago or even more so I don't show many references whenever I do it here's all the references that end up going with the studies that went along with this and Jehudi Nock Again, a 12th dynasty noble, a governor, uh, apparently a faded blonde man, and an endemic Caucasian Egyptian. But of course, they didn't start, oop, they snuck in in the 12th dynasty. No, no. We've shown already, they go well before that point. They founded it in the first place. Peace.